The Paradine Case. Welcome back uh, to Foreign Correspondents Deeper into Hitchcock. Uh, my name is Michał Oleszczyk and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host. Sebastian Smoliński. Hello. This is the uh, episode number 33. Uh, we took a little bit of a break because we feel it's, it's, it's important to take a break every uh, once in a while. And we feel that uh, Alfred Hitchcock would uh, have um, agreed with us. Uh, and uh, now we are back on track and um, we are about to discuss uh, another film in our ongoing mission to discuss every single film in Alfred Hitchcock's filmography uh, and this film today will be The Paradine Case from 1947. Before we start um, we want to thank everyone who listens to us. We got some very nice email messages and also some very nice comments on our YouTube page and uh, this is a good occasion to simply ask everybody who listens to this podcast, everybody who uh, enjoys it, um, to share it uh, with other Hitchcock fans. We really appreciate and we are so, so happy when, when this podcast reaches uh, new audiences. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, one of our listeners, the eminent Professor Sidney Gottlieb, who edited a book on Hitchcock, actually several books mm. on Hitchcock, but uh, one of the fo foundational books that I read when I was a teenager, Hitchcock on Hitchcock, uh, we were able to meet in New York and it was a wonderful meeting. Uh, so that was a living proof that this podcast ha actually uh, has, has an audience and also an audience of Hitchcock scholars and, um, and students and right? students because uh, Sidney Gottlieb told me that as he was teaching a class, at NYU, a Hitchcock class at, at NYU, he actually uses some of the episodes that we recorded. So for us, uh, recording this episode on a rainy day in cold Warsaw in February 2023, this is kind of a mind-blowing mind um, uh, information because it means that our uh, work uh, has meaning and uh, has meaning for multiple uh, Hitchcock fans uh, in different parts of the world. So the Paradigm case is the final film uh, that Hitchcock made in collaboration with David O. Selznick. We discussed several of those films. This is the seventh uh, that uh, finished the contract between uh, Hitchcock and Selznick. Last time we discussed the wonderful, mm. brilliant, mm. Uh, notorious, uh, which probably is the single best film that uh, was uh, brought about by this collaboration. <laughs> and this one is probably the worst one. Uh, but uh, let's not dismiss it right off the bat because this podcast is also for us to revisit those films and to, to see if they work or don't work. Uh, what, what is the state of, um, of the Paradigm case in this, in this case? Uh, but th the first th thing that I just want to say I revisited this film after many, many, many years, mm. uh, and I'm I, I'm flabbergasted by the simple piece of information <laughs> that this film cost almost as much as Gone with the Wind. This is amazing. <laughs> and this probably, when you are watching this film, you would never think that this this was such an expensive uh, film and and actually a flop because it it never recovered this this cost. So this is my first question. Uh, why? Why did this relatively simple courtroom mm. drama uh, set in London, uh, focusing on a case of, of of a barrister played by Gregory Peck, why would this film cost mm. that much? That, that's 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 my initial. That's question. a that's a great question, and I was thinking about it, and 
Gone with the Wind parallel is uh, interesting, but I'm thinking about Cleopatra, for example. About, I think it's a it's a movie which kind of um, introduces this um, feeling that will be prevalent in the 1960s that there is something wrong with the system, with the Hollywood system. Of course, in the 1960s, the the system was dissolving or already was uh, dissolved in many ways. And so on but here we have a like a taste of things to come meaning that what can happen when hollywood spends a lot of money but uh, everything is is crazy or is uh, governed in a very bad way so for example for example one of the reasons why the movie costs so much um are the ceilings for example right hitchcock uh knew that he can um argue for uh, a lot of money from selznick that it kind of uh, Selznick wanted him to have these luxurious conditions to work and Hitchcock ordered uh, ceilings for, as far as I remember, $15,000, a lot of money back then, which are ba barely seen in the movie, right? So it's one of the examples. And of course, um, it's also the great story which uh, Leonard Leff uh, describes, you know, this great story of this collaboration which is really now uh, in a terrible state and we can see in the Paradigm case, like two movies actually, right? The one that maybe Hitchcock kind of wanted to make, but his mind was already in the future, in his own productions. At the time that he's preparing this film, Transatlantic Pictures um, is being created by him and-, and A production Sydney, company yeah. that, that will produce the next film. Rope and, mm -hmm. Rope and Under Capricorn. Uh, so yeah, so that's one of the and reshoots, uh, 92 days of shooting, uh, it's, it's crazy, and also overseas production, so I think a bit like, exactly a bit like this Hollywood European movies of the 1950s and 60s, like once again, Cleopatra, right? The, the, the story behind the movie is kind of more mm -hmm. interesting than the movie itself, and the movie is uh, not even a compromise, but, a, but it's a disaster, and you can sense it almost from the first scene, that nothing almost works here, I think, and there are like this different... Um, elements which will don't come together but they kind of drive in opposite directions I think that's kind of that's something you feel in this film I, th I think mm. we'll, we'll discuss it in detail but also the, the, the thing for me that was most difficult to uh, accept and th that's why I think this movie is such a bore you know and I think it's interesting that when Hitchcock is not very good he, he can be very boring because <laughs> some directors if they're not good they are I don't know interesting strange uh, crazy or you know you you may be you may have some pleasure in observing their uh, uh, failures but here I think it's just a very boring film mm. which um, is also the the nadir we could say na nadir of uh, Hollywood British productions mm. uh, of, of, of these productions I've read recently a small chapter in Charles Barr's uh, very short introduction to British cinema so we say hello to Professor Barr, uh, our, who was our, our guest, guest and, yes. and supporter along the way. Thank you for that. And it was a it was a great, great piece about 1940s Hollywood cinema, 1930s actually, right? The, this fascination of Hollywood with Britain starting in the 1930s, we could say. There were some Oscar nominations. Uh, of course, Laurence Olivier's movies are somehow part of that. But in 1947, it was almost the end of that. And you can sense that this movie tries to be very British and scouting locations also took a lot of time and a lot of money and so on. But really this Britishness is so boring in this film. <laughs> I have this feeling. Well, the, the Britishness here is quite uh, inconsistent also because um, Gregory Peck's character, I mean, who is he supposed to be? Is he a British barrister? I mean, he doesn't speak like, like a Brit. Uh, my understanding also is that the cost of recreating the, the old Bailey, the, the, mm -hmm. the courtroom was also uh, very high. And uh, of course, I would, I would agree, although next year, 1948, uh, it will be exactly the year when mm -hmm. uh, Laurence Olivier will w win the main Oscar, uh, the Best Picture Oscar for Hamlet, which, which was a British production. Uh, which uh, which is another another story and Laurence Olivier was also considered here for for this part that ultimately Gregory Peck played but also we mm, well I wouldn't dismiss the mm -hmm. film as completely mm -hmm. boring although I I do think it's it's not exciting at all it's two uh, hours first almost. first of all I don't think I mean 
this almost is like it's not a Hitchcock picture because I think that Hitchcock was absent in a way like like he wasn't in it you know he wasn't really invested in it it feels exactly like a contractual obligation <laughs> to finish this this troubled uh, stellar but troubled collaboration with uh, Selznick and you know the, the the fact that Selznick was the author of the script I mean the the, the one of the authors it, it's a complicated story of how the script came into being from from a book by robert hitchens which actually and i think this is a giveaway that selznick bought many years later uh, the rights to in early 30s so he wanted to make this film for a long time and mm. if, if something has been on the shelf for such a long time and especially because he dreamt up that this novel by by Robert Hitchens was such a wonderful vehicle for Greta Garbo mm -hmm. and then her comeback right? her comeback kind of... and you know she didn't want to play this part uh, that that ultimately went to Ali Davali uh, credited as Vali yes. <laughs> in, in the credits That's great. That's just as she was credited one year later two years later actually on the third man where she was actually wonderful and mm. she she became iconic in the third man the Carol Reed uh, picture um but here i think it has this 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 uh, this air of a film that the producer wanted to make that actually obsessively wanted in a way to make i mean he spent all this money on it he was invested in it as a, as a screenwriter but the director was not not really in it mm -hmm. uh, he was not into it i think hitchcock was simply not into this movie and hence there, there is so little of Hitchcock. I mean, I think mm -hmm. of all the Hitchcock the films that we discussed mm -hmm. so far, I mean, this is the one that really, I mean, if, if you submitted it to this sort of Pepsi test, you know, like, pe is it yeah. Pepsi-Cola, is it Coca-Cola? And, you know, uh, uh, connoisseurs will always know which, which, is, which is which. I think here you could fool, I mean, had it been not for the historical record, we know that the uh, Hitchcock movie, but I think you, you would you could fool many mm -hmm. Hitchcock scholars by showing them this film and ask, asking, is it Hitchcock or is it not Hitchcock, Hitchcock? Because it doesn't feel like a Hitchcock, like a Hitchcock film. And uh, I guess one of the reasons for that is that Hitchcock seems pretty indifferent to, to Valley, as it were. Mm. I mean, he's not fascinated by her. I don't know. If, mm -hmm. Is it the brown hair? <laughs> is it the is it the uh, Italian air about her? As we know, he was more into this sort of austere Scandinavian slash waspish um, femininity. Uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know. But this film uh, has the marks of a work that the director was not invested in. Simply, he was not invested in, in, in into it. And uh, and this is, I think, the main problem with the film that it's so lukewarm i mean it's a long courtroom drama mm -hmm. that for some reason makes us believe or, or tries to make us believe that that gregory peck is this london barrister uh, that the thing is taking place in london even though it was shot in those elaborate sets and um and yeah this is the first thing and and you know when when you hear the big ben chiming at the beginning <laughs> and you think oh Hitchcock probably had some kicks, you know, from mm. like returning home or whatever. But he didn't really return home with this film. And, and there, there is no, none of that giddy uh, pleasure that he took in presenting London as a exciting cinematic city mm -hmm. in The Lodger, of course, but also later, let's say, in Frenzy uh, uh, with a with couple of films along, along the way. So this is my, my, my main accusation to be made against this film is that it's very plodding, slow, mm -hmm. uh, lukewarm, uh, like lugubrious, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's simply mm -hmm. it moves very, very, very slowly. And, uh, and, and the main, 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 main theme, this fascination that this barrister has for, for the defendant in a murder trial uh, Valley plays a woman who is accused of having uh, murdered her blind, wa wealthy husband. There's simply, uh, th th there's no dramatic weight to this fascination because you don't feel that Gregory Peck could at any point engage in any sort of spectacular self-destruction over this woman, you know? Uh, uh, 
you will feel it in, in Scotty, in many, many, mm-hmm. many different characters in Hitchcock, that these are the men who are ready to go to extremes, you know, because of their obsession. Here, it's like they have several conversations. <laughs> His wife is worried, but... Uh, but, but just a bit. Yeah, just, <laughs> just a bit, and there's no... Um, vertigo as it as it were i mean it's very 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 cold the only notable exception i would say here and we can discuss it Mm -hmm. in a a minute is the reappearance in hitchcock's oeuvre of charles Charles uh, lotton who was there Mm -hmm. in in jamaica in another lesser hitchcock Mm -hmm. Uh, but here he's he's interesting and and what's most interesting is his wife played by ethel barrymore nominated for an Academy Award for supporting performance, who gets the best moment in the film, late in the story. I- I'm not surprised she was nominated because mm-hmm. she has a wonderful small moment when she asks her husband, Charles Lawton, to be merciful on, on Ali the Valley character. When, when, when we know, spoiler alert, we know that Valley, uh, Mrs. Paradine, killed her husband actually, or at least she convincingly says so that she did. Uh, uh, there's this tiny moment when Ethel Barrymore pleads mercy with with her husband, and and I think that's the only scene that's actually that that works in the movie, and mm-hmm. we can we can come mm-hmm. back to it. But Lawton is is I guess the the reason to see the film. I I would say, I would say yes, definitely. When you mentioned that authorists in us are disappointed with the film because it's not Hitchcockian, of course I I wanted to say that yeah, there's just one Hitchcockian element, precisely Charles Lawton and the way. Hitchcock decides, for example, to shoot a creepy scene with him and Anne Todd, right? When he sees her, part of her arm, oh, naked, yes, and yes. then sits next to him. It's, it's very He creepy. grabs her by the hand. And, and, and it's totally a moment mm-hmm. of, you can feel that Hitchcock in his mind kind of impersonates, uh, maybe subconsciously impersonates this character in that scene. I mean, this is what uh, we are talking nowadays about Hitchcock as this... Uh, kind of predatory like figure and director and this is precisely visible in that scene which happens in as in rope the murder it happens in broad daylight right the, the, the it's dining room every, um, her husband is like three meters away and he's he's sitting next to her and st- starts to touch her so these are like the small hitchcockian elements and yeah and and uh, and the final scene i'm I, I would like to go back to it but um, yes, I think there are several other problems. Of course, the casting of Peck, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's a famous story that he was miscast and that he hated the film and that Hitchcock said that he had true fault, that he's not a good actor and so on. And there's even a piece of dialogue which I wrote down. I think his wife, if I'm not mistaken, tells him, you're, you're so transparent. Mm. And this is precisely the problem. So <laughs> she spells out the problem of this character and mm. of Peck, right? You are so transparent. There is no, uh, exactly, there's no obsession mm-hmm. in his eyes. There is nothing um, that could kind of unsettle us. Uh, many, many great Hitchcock heroes are full of anxiety. They are afraid of many things, right? And that, that's the pleasure of it. Even James Stewart in Rear Window. But here we don't have it. Yeah, uh, I agree. I mean... Exactly, James Stewart in Rare Window, uh, the nicest guy in America, and yet yeah. you can see that Hitchcock showed some darkness in in, in him. And here, Peck, I mean, he was so young uh, at that point, and, and and for some reason, you know, he has his hair uh, whitened for the mm. film. There are those streaks of gray in mm. his hair, which I guess was the only trial, you know, to make him into into I don't know a man of experience, a man who, you know, maybe is in li- like in a midlife crisis. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but also there's this startling. I mean, I mean, I think there was material here for mm-hmm. Hitchcock. I think there was material here because, and and maybe, I, I know that I I mean Patrick McGilligan writes in his book about this strange collaboration between Hitchcock and this Scottish playwright uh, mm-hmm. James Birdie mm-hmm. that he met him in Scotland and Birdie was sort of like secretive, like yeah. he, he would only like. Uh, hand him the finished pages like it was, you can imagine those meetings you know in scotland uh, but 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 what i'm what, what i'm trying to say is that th- there is some intriguing uh, uh, concept in this story for example and i think this is something that hitchcock could swoop down onto is the concept of a beautiful woman married to a blind man mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and and there's this moment city when lights uh, reversed city <laughs> lights exactly exactly um 
but, but but you know there's this moment when peck goes to this sort of cottage right mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. they 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 inhabit it and he sees this gorgeous place which you know you can think of uh, mrs danvers and rebecca a little bit you know that the and and you see that there's a portrait of the wife hanged on the on the wall and you ask yourselves why like what mm. why would this blind man commission a portrait of mm. his beautiful wife like why would he marry her uh, and i'm not saying that you know marriage is all about appearances but but she is striking beautiful so the, 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 there must have been some interesting dynamics mm. there between you know we remember the blind man for example from saboteur right mm. or um uh, who is like sort of the saintly figure but here like how did this relationship look like like why why mm. did he commission this beautiful portrait of her you know why is this place so gorgeously kept so maybe he was like like this sort of blind esthete you know that he mm. still enjoyed you know um uh, uh, maybe through touch that would be also interesting mm. right or how how did so 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 there's this interesting uh, uh, point that there was this marriage of, a, of this gorgeous woman and this blind man which is unexplored um, and Peck has a marriage here that with a, with a wife called Gay by the mm. way who is not that is not very interesting and also when Louis Jordan I mean this is such a, such a strange cast when you, even when you see the cast at the beginning you know Alida Valley, Gregory Peck, Anne Todd yeah. and suddenly Louis Jordan yeah. in his first American yeah. role yeah. He would, of course, later on play uh, in Gigi, which is uh, yeah the, probably mo- more disturbing than all the Hitchcock films <laughs> to, put together. Yeah. Uh, With but, Maurice Chevalier singing yes, about uh, about little girls yeah. and you know Leslie Caron. Uh, never mind. I mean, uh, but but here he's he's this sort of petulant Frenchman, mm. you know, sort of, and uh, I don't know. So so I, I guess there are some bits and pieces that mm-hmm. could be mm-hmm. that could be interesting uh, and. Charles Lofton is a part of that, but yeah, yeah, what, yeah. what to do? Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, mm. One more thing, uh, Hitchcock was always you know, adamant about making uh, whodunits, but this film, after all, is more or less a whodunit. I mean, we as the audience, we don't know that she committed this crime from the very beginning, right? We don't have this opening scene that would depict the crime, and then we could have some suspense associated with uh, Gregory Peck trying to defend her or not, right? Or when will the audience get to know that she killed him, right? We, we don't have it. We we have this strange murder mystery, which is uh, which actually even Hitchcock didn't understand. It's a very mm-hmm. funny situation. It's like <laughs> a very postmodern situation because he was explaining, I don't know how the rooms uh, <laughs> were organized in this mansion. I don't know how, how this um, murder took place, right? And the director is saying that. It's, it's a bit like blind director in Woody Allen, right? It's like, right, right. So it's right. a very funny situation. Or Howard Cox yeah. in Big Sleep. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but, but less, yes, less, exactly. less fun. Exa- <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes, so, so that's why I think another reason why it doesn't work. But I think um, this movie is interesting visually, at least in some moments. Uh, and it's also a big story why it looks like it does. And um, our previous guest, uh, Professor Patrick Keating, uh, told us, and I think it's, it's part of the episode, that he's now writing a, a book about lighting in f- film noir. I can't wait for that book. It will be very interesting, I think. And he says that the Paradin case is beautifully, beautifully lit. Mm. Uh, at least that, right? But yeah, it, it's true. And for example, the, there was this discussion of how uh, Hitchcock should depict Louis Jordan in this, in the, when he appears the first time. And actually, I think it's, it's a strange choice, after all, because Hitchcock chose to uh, put him in the shadow completely. Mm-hmm. So in, in, this, in this first scene, when Gregory Peck visits the mansion, we, we don't even see his face. And of course, Selznick goes, oh, it's my star, show his eyes, he has great eyes. So there was like, it's fascinating for me to kind of follow these aesthetic discussions, right, between Selznick uh, and between Hitchcock. And... That's why this movie is so uh, fragmented in a way or um, also in a way butchered, right? Because Mm. the first cut had like three hours and it's the moment when Hitchcock starts to experiment with long takes, Mm. right? Of course, for me, these long takes make it even more boring, you know, Mm. I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't think they are as effective as his, his future long takes, but here we have uh, some of them, we have, um, in moments beautiful camera work for example in the in the first scene when the camera wants to introduce uh, 
Alida Valli as Selznick would have wanted to introduce mm. her. So the camera glides around her head and we mm. see her from the back. And of course, women shown from the back, the, the back of their hair is also part of Hitchcock. Uh, visual motives that will appear mm. uh, to an even more obsessive degree later on but this this, this introduction is beautiful and this very british moment that uh, when the police takes her she says oh i think i won't be back for dinner like she, she says who, to her servant it's it's okay and also i think i don't know if you would agree and it's maybe stretching it a bit but i i, I have the feeling that these prison scenes which was were also part of the discussion between selznick and, mm. and hitchcock because hitchcock was aiming at austere uh, compositions and austere atmosphere and says, oh, no, 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 we, we have to have like, you know, these more beautiful prisons. Mm. So we, when, you, when you ask why this mansion is so beautiful, of course, you can find explanations in the plot, but also I think it's basically because Selznick wanted to show a beautiful mansion, right? Mm. There's always this tension between glamour and, and storytelling in, the, in their films. But these prison scenes, they have a, a, just a, a bit of Bresson, you know, mm. <laughs> in, their, in, in how they are shot. And it's, it's the moment, I think, in this film when Hitchcock's obsession with hands mm. and Bresson's obsession with hands kind of come together uh, because the, the most intimate moments between Peck and Alida Valli is precisely one of these scenes in prisons when he touches her hands. Mm. We have a close-up of these hands. And it's a pretty austere moment. And I, I have a feeling that because of the subdued acting style that also Hitchcock was trying to enforce and Selznick was against. Uh, so another point of um, discussion. Because of her austere acting style, I had, the, I had this Bressonian uh, feeling about, about mm. these scenes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't have that exact feeling, but, um, but who knows? I mean, uh, he, the, the Hitchcock had to entertain him itself somehow on this film mm -hmm. right so maybe he invested uh, some some feeling into those those scenes but well uh, i don't know alida valley also it, she doesn't strike me as a hitchcock heroine you know she she's not um, she's not the type to be a hitchcock mm. heroine i think uh, you mentioned bresson he was making uh, this well a little bit earlier this film with maria Casares, um dames of the bois de boulogne mm. I don't know, they strike me as a similar type, you know, this sort of slick hair, um, uh, combed back, and they, they, they you know, I, I, the, the thing is here that, and this is actually an interesting concept, that the wife of the barrister, Peck, uh, she really doesn't want this woman to be killed. Uh, that, that, that's the, probably the most interesting thing, because, you know, she's jealous of her, she knows that her husband has feelings for this woman. So the quote unquote logical thing would be, oh, mm -hmm. I hope that she will mm -hmm. get the death sentence, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. then she will. But the wife knows that if that happens, uh, Mrs. Paradine will be fixed in her husband's mind forever as this martyr, that as this martyred woman, this, and, and he will be always in love with her, mm -hmm. like Max de Winter in yeah. with Rebecca. Her, with her right? image. With her mm -hmm. image, right? So. What she is hoping for a little bit is that is that actually, you know, she she hopes the wife hopes for the destruction of this dangerous illusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's an interesting, complex situation mm -hmm. because basically she wants her husband to sort of see through the illusion that he has that the, uh, of, of, of that woman. Right. And the wife is patient enough sort of and also the the last scene of the film reaffirms it like you you can come back to me it's okay right now you know that she was actually you know uh, a murderess mm -hmm. um so so it's a, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting concept uh, because you know for scotty for example mm -hmm. the fact that madeline was was killed preserved her in this sort of like you know shrine exactly mm -hmm. she fixed forever um and rebecca of course was also a character that was enshrined by her death it's a very romantic notion uh, so here i would say that uh, reality wins right mm -hmm. this sort of the, the fantasy is successfully killed i think the, the the only interesting thing is and i really don't know like did she really kill her husband or is she saying that mm -hmm. in court to protect the to protect the memory of her dead lover mm -hmm. of uh, Louis Jordan who killed himself but also to really spite uh, 
a peck like you know you thought i i was innocent i'm actually a murderess you know yeah. i'm i'm uh, the, 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 that's prefigured in the scene in the be in the prison when she says that oh i'm not innocent you know mm -hmm. like I, I i i'm actually i'm very experienced i, I used men in my life so here maybe for the last time she's saying like you thought i'm innocent mm -hmm. you thought i'm an angel i'm actually w even worse than you thought right so that's yes. interesting but it's not played in no, an interesting yeah that, way. that's very interesting because this is mm -hmm. this the nucleus of let's say the the the, uh, the embryonic form of this self-destructive man right which mm -hmm. as you meant it's not played out it's not uh, even narratively coherent but yeah it's it's very interesting and just I wanted to add a few words to to this um, wife husband relationship. Yes, uh, I agree totally that in a way she wants to win her husband as equals with that woman. Mm -hmm. But also I think there is this feeling that she may have this feeling that the husband will just um, be destroyed by this by the mm -hmm. effect if she, if she were to die. Right? Uh, she will that he will kind of like Scotty in Vertigo, mm. right, who has nervous breakdown. And mm -hmm. uh, this experience is so powerful. Of course, that's just me kind of putting that in, into the movie, but I think there is something about mm -hmm. it, that mm -hmm. this relationship, at least on, on the page, in the, in the idea of the film is so strong mm -hmm. that the Gregory Peck character will be destroyed by the, mm -hmm. let's say, disappearance of that woman. Right. So I, I, think, I think it's there, and she, in that way she wants to save him, but also this movie, of course, has this mother slash whore, uh, talking about symbols this this relationship be between these two women it's also something that Hitchcock probably could have um, kind of play out more interestingly that there is nothing exciting let's say in Anne Todd who prepares him a drink when he mm. comes home and she's like a totally obedient post-war and she's uh, cozy, you know? yes, and she's because, un, yeah. because she never there was an actress that never projected any kind of mystery. I mean, she was always very, very bland. Yes, I'm sorry to say, but that that's the case, yeah. you know. Yeah. David Lean made this movie with her Madeline, I think mm -hmm. it was like the whole woman of mystery. But uh -huh, it, uh -huh. it, it was his wife actually, right? She was married to David Lean. Oh wow, he had so many wives. But, uh, but so, but, but there is no mystery to yes. her as a presence. She's very reassuring, but exactly. there's no mystery. But that would be the precisely like, like in Vertigo, right? Scotty has a friend, and she's also not interesting for him. But that could be a jumping point for Gregory Peck character to see some, to seek some adventure, mm -hmm. some excitement, some even danger with uh, Alida Valley. But of course, Peck and his and this film he's incapable of kind of transmitting that we don't feel that at all yeah. we don't feel he wants some enjoyment that's no, true he's just that's so focused true. on his work that's and true. these moments when he gets upset when somebody tells him oh maybe she killed him mm. no no she sh i'm sure she didn't yeah. get out of here right it's it's strange and it's kind of like throwback to spellbound when he was mm. this very mentally unstable character but here it doesn't add up to to his persona mm. but one more question i wanted to mm -hmm. ask you what do you think about this uh because I think there is some uh, homosocial subtext in the mm. relation between Louis Jordan and, and the master, right? I, th I, I think so, yeah. yeah the, you, you feel that the, he's a queer quite, fellow and It's so quite on. obvious that yeah. there's this queer fellow and also a quote and uh, at some point uh, he said like something he was not interested in women. Uh, yeah, he hates all women. Yeah, he hates <laughs> all women. <laughs> that, uh, that's, so that's there's, a great one. There's, the, there's the thing and uh, maybe, you know, from today's perspective that that, that would be I think crazy to mention the name of the wife, which is gay, right? Mm -hmm. But never yeah, mind. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that yes, th th there is something, and th the presence of Charles Lawton, who always brings with him a little bit of this, of this sort of queer presence, mm -hmm. I think also reference it. But um, I don't think it goes mm -hmm. anywhere interesting. Uh, the, the thing is that, um, again, you would never guess that this was an expensive film by looking at it. You would also never get, guess that it was in so much trouble with censorship because mm -hmm. the mention of suicide, the sort of bl uh, blatant mention of the word suicide mm -hmm. was also problematic at the time. Nowadays, it's not problematic mm -hmm. anymore. So this was a battle with censorship that he had to go through. And, uh, you know, the, 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 yes, and then you read, you know, the, oh, there was this... Uh, the, the, the interesting thing about this film you have to read from mm -hmm. outside of exactly. the film, you know, that exactly. oh, so the, uh, the the set was so big and the camera work was pioneering because he shot the courtroom scenes with four cameras mm -hmm. simultaneously and that was, uh, that was a pioneering movement and actually it enabled him later on to 
you know, he rehearsed some of the effects that he will use in Rope. Mm -hmm. Great, mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, and that's that's real. It's not, you know, I'm not being facetious, but it's just, it's not that exciting on the screen. And also, I think dramatically, one crucial potential is never tapped, and that would be the confrontation of the women, right? The confrontation of the wife and of Ali Davali. They don't even look that that much at one another in the mm -hmm. courtroom, mm -hmm. and that would be an interesting, you know, sort of duel between mm -hmm. those two women. One is wed to the barrister and the second one has the barrister in his power at least temporarily mm. and they could you know face off one another interesting uh, in an interesting fashion but um, but that doesn't happen as well so for me this is a, a sad late footnote uh, to the contract that brought at least two very very interesting films one masterpiece notorious right but mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a contractual obligation this film and i'm very happy that we are done with it because i don't really feel that it's no. that it um, amounts to much it's it's also yeah. one of the i think least studied hitchcock movies yeah, so yeah. um it'll be interesting to see the full cut i mean i'm not <laughs> saying the, the three hours but interesting the, are you sure that's, that's the no, good word uh, yeah but, but who knows i mean i, I don't mm -hmm. even mean the three hours i mean the uh, uh -huh. 132 minutes mm -hmm. that it was the premiere version mm -hmm. which was lost then in, in a fire or in a flooding uh maybe yeah. sometimes you know a longer cut mm -hmm. can feel mm -hmm. shorter so who knows but we won't ever see it because apparently that that cut was destroyed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um and, and and as I said, the only wonderful moment I think is when Ethel Barrymore uh, is having dinner with her husband, and she says something like, uh, "Maybe don't send her to the gallows." Mm -hmm. And he says, "Well, but she's guilty." Mm -hmm. And she's an interesting thing. And she says that, "Oh, but but, but exactly because she is guilty, she needs our mercy." Mm -hmm. And this is a deep f thought, of course, Christian Christian thought. But the way that Ethel Barrymore plays it. It's, it's consummate acting because she says it in such a delicate way. She knows that she won't prevail with the husband. I, I think this is absolutely great acting. And I, I and this is mm. when you know that she's uh, a Barrymore. I agree. I agree. <laughs> she's amazing yeah. in this scene. But I, I wanted to ask you about the scene itself because I think it's, it's a very sour, very, very sad scene showing once again this toxic marriage this this dysfunctional marriage full mm. of pain because it's like the dinners in the friends in frenzy yes yes mm -hmm. so so that's i uh, i was like i was i know that Truffaut mentions that scene as wonderful but i i, I mm. think it's in a way it's like it's very um very sad and very mm, distressing because you can really feel that the wife has like she has a terrible life with Charles Lawton and and even in previous scenes it's also um, kind of suggested when she almost stutters when she's mm -hmm. with him right in this in this dining room mm -hmm. scene so mm -hmm. so uh, for me oh that's the word it's a painful scene mm -hmm. for me and I'm not I'm, I'm not sure if in a good way I'm mm -hmm. not sure where Hitchcock stands in this as an as a let's well, say I, I think it's a truthful depiction of being married to Charles Lawton <laughs> oh, as, yeah, a, as a woman as, but uh, that's true it, it is painful scene but I think that there's a note of gracefulness about her yes we mm -hmm. know and this is the this is the, this is great acting because we mm -hmm. know that her life is a torment with this man uh, but we also know that she has enough of gracefulness of, of spirit that she she rises above it i mean she we know that she is better than him i know we know that when she makes this plea that uh, that she's simply a better person that she is that that, that, that he that, that he is and she i think she just plays this tiny micro moment i i mean it's the only moment in the film that i really believe in because mm -hmm. i don't believe in the marriage of gregor peck and Anne Todd. i don't believe in the friendship between the uh the, the the daughter of Charles Coburn and and Anto I mean it's it's nothing yeah I mean, the, there's they t talk and supposedly they they have this like they are trying to save you know <laughs> Gregory but, but but it doesn't work in this moment I think it works uh, but it's a tiny moment in a long film so I would I think this is this 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 is the last thing for me and I know you know recently I've been thinking about the passage of time 
and also because I rewatched Rope, which we'll discuss. <laughs> and uh, and I, 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 I don't think I will rewatch this film again. <laughs> you know, like I, I'm not planning to rewatch The Parody. It case. sounds very final, Michal. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I really, I really think I will never rewatch this film unless it will happen by accident at some yes, point. I'm not yes, planning on yes. rewatching this film in the future. So nice. this is a, s a sad thought. So but we say goodbye to the Paradigm case. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not. I'm not excited to uh, unless maybe the full cut will be, you know, recovered. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, some films, I, I, I think simply two viewings are enough. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, but no thanks. Yes. And that way we finish. The, yeah. The so episode. this is the the Paradigm case. And uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please uh, like us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. Uh, foreign correspondence deeper into Hitchcock. Please share. This is the most important thing, really. Mm. And uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please listen to the others. And leave and a review if you can. And that leave you a review, a comment, uh, or, or, or a star rating on iTunes. This this really uh, helps to, to bring this uh, podcast to attention. So, this was the Paradigm case. Uh, and uh, next time we will discuss Rope. And I think we will have... Um, more fun uh, more fun or more things to say so uh, till the next time this was uh, the 33rd episode of foreign correspondence deeper into hitchcock <laughs>